Tonight we're going to go over the principles of work and energy on a system of particles. This is based on statics and dynamics for engineers. If this is not the video you want to find, if you're just a high school student looking for high school physics sheets and answers, this is not the video, okay? Um, tonight we're going to go over what conservation of energy has to do in terms of a system of particles in motion um, and how to boil that down into equations you're going to see in a textbook. So, uh, physics tells us that, and I'm going to use different variables possibly that we're going to see. Um, you might see T and V used for kinetic and potential energy. I'm going to use K and U. Okay, so K are markers. K are kinetic energy, final, plus U, our potential energy, final, is equal to K, our kinetic energy, initial plus U, our kinetic energy, initial, okay? We can boil that down and rewrite that into the summation of our initial kinetic energy plus the difference between our potential energy initial minus our final is equal to the summation of our final kinetic energy, okay? Which you might also see as K1 plus U1 minus two is equal to K2, or T1 plus V1 minus two is equal to T2. So all sorts of different ways of writing, okay? Pretty much what this says is that when dealing with system equations of motion, you cannot take a system and get rid of any of these parts, okay? They always have to exist. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed um, in any way, shape, or form. It's always gonna be repurposed. So you will see that if our kinetic energy increases in a system, so say we have a falling object on this sort of path, at this point, if we put it on a x, y position chart, okay? Or two Cartesian axes, at this point high, on our y-axis, when we're talking about height, you have an increase in potential energy, okay? As this goes, our potential energy will decrease as our height decreases, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. At the same time, due to the acceleration due to gravity, if we have a velocity of zero here, as we fall, gravity is going to pull that object down faster and faster until it reaches its own um, its own top speed in air due to its air resistance. And we're going to see our kinetic energy at the ground being a max. Okay, so the higher we go, the higher potential energy to start, as long as we aren't falling. And the faster we go, generally, our kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is related to one half, not one fifth, one half, our mass times our velocity squared, okay? So as our velocity increases, due to the fact that this is a multiplication to a constant, so our velocity increases, our Can kinetic energy is the same in relation to what I just said. If you're at all confused about how I go through this, feel free to rewind the video, it's the beauty of YouTube, okay? So we have a crane that's going to lift a 2.5 megagram with a big M beam, okay? And it's going to do so with a force. Mind you, it's a function, okay? It's a variable force, okay? A force of 28 plus 3s squared times 10 to the third newtons, okay? We know that T1 minus, apologize, see I'm doing what your textbook does, unless you have a good textbook that uses K. K1 minus U, one minus two, is equal to K2, okay? K1 is gonna deal with velocity equal to zero, right? Because K is equal to one half mass times velocity squared. And if velocity is equal to zero, K is equal to zero. So we're not gonna deal with this. So in the equation as you watch, zero will represent k throughout the rest of this. That's equal to the integral 
from 0 to 2, I'm sorry, 0 to 3, which is where we're trying to go, we're trying to find velocity at s, or our distance, equal to 3 meters, and we're also going to try and find our change in time at s equal to 3 meters. Okay, So we're going to integrate this with in between 0 and 3 meters as we raise this beam. Okay, So we're going to deal with this as 28 times 10 to the third newtons. Okay. Oh, ds minus 2.5 times 10 to the third times 9.8 newtons. 9.8 is our constant for the acceleration due to gravity. Okay, when you multiply that by a mass, you're going to get a force. Is F is equal to MA. Force is equal to mass times acceleration, always. That's our basic law. It's the most helpful thing you'll ever learn in physics, okay? So, did I write that correctly? No, I did not. Got you mistakes. This is a variable. It's not a constant. 20 plus 3s squared times 10 to the third. We're just going to rewrite this. Okay, 28 plus 3s squared times 7 to the third newtons, ds, minus 2.5 times 7 to the third times 9.8 newtons, okay? We're going to rewrite that equal to our final stage, okay? Which is going to be equal to 1 over 2, right, pay attention, 1 over 2 times 2.5 times 10 to the third v squared. And I'm going to write it around. Okay, minus 2.5 times 10 to the third times 9.8 is equal to 1 half of 2.5 times 10 to the third times v squared. Correct? Correct. Okay. This is also, if you go back to its basic function, one half our mass times our velocity squared. Okay? 2.5 to the third grams, not newtons. Okay? When we go back through, after we integrate all this, which I'm not going to do because you technically don't need to know how to integrate this. Okay? Just understanding the concept that we're dealing with is the integration of our. Um, our energy equations, okay? That's the basic thing I want you to understand, okay? When we're done solving this, once you do all your algebra and figure out exactly where we are, we understand that our velocity is equal to 2.78 s, okay? 2.78 dependent on our height, okay, s, plus 0.8 s cubed, all of that raised to the one half power, okay, or the square root of this total function, okay, which when we plug in s of 3, we get a velocity, so s equals 3, we get a velocity equal to 5.47 meters per second, okay, and if you go through and plug this in your calculator, 2.78 times 3 plus 0 0.8 times 3 cubed. Take the square root of that, you get 5.47 meters per second. Okay? Now, we're not done because what they really want from us also in the second part is our change in time. Okay? In which case, pardon me, we're going to go back and use this same equation, understanding that 2.78. Let's actually clean this up. Let's erase this. You guys can go back if you need to find this. Okay? Two point seven eight 
S plus 0 0.8 S cubed raised to one half is equal to dS over dt, okay? This is our change in height over time, okay? We understand that velocity is change in height over time, acceleration is change in velocity over time, sorry, change in position for velocity, Ch velocity is change in position over time, okay? All these things are just derivatives of each other. So position is the antiderivative, you could say, of velocity. What we're gonna do here is integrate with respect to time, okay, to try and find time. What we're gonna do is say that 2.78s plus 0.8s cubed ds is equal to ds over dt, okay? We're then gonna say that t is going to equal the integral, okay, from zero to three, of ds, yes, ds, over 2.78s plus 0.8s cubed to the one half. Okay? Understanding is the integral to get t. Okay? We could say if I raise this and came over here, that this was actually equal to um, ds, sorry, dt times this whole function, so I'm gonna call f of x is equal to ds, okay? When we do an integral, we understand is that it's gonna take away our dt. We're gonna be replaced with time after we integrate this. Okay, which ends up, if we just want dt alone by itself, dt is equal to ds over f of x. In which case, we integrate this portion in order to get time by itself, not the change in time. dt is our change in time. We want just time. Okay? So, if you plug this into your calculator, which you can do definite integrals in your calculators, don't tell your teachers I told you that a TI-84 plus will do definite integrals if you know what you're doing and you spend a lot of time looking around it, okay? Once you integrate this, we're gonna find that time between zero and three meters is gonna be 1.79 seconds, okay? That's our time, okay? We're gonna do one more example real quick. It's a quick one. It's really not that bad. Like, really not that bad, okay? If you drive, you heard this in driver's ed. If you don't drive, you will hear this in driver's ed, hopefully, okay? You also hear a ton of awful stuff that you don't really need to hear, but they're gonna make you sit there anyway. Okay, we've got a car. Pardon my drawing, I'm just gonna draw a brick, because I can't draw. Our car has initial velocity of V1, okay? Actually, it has initial velocity of 40 meters per second, okay? And it's gonna stop in 30 meters, okay? You're gonna hit the brakes. You're going 40 meters a second and you see a deer. You hit the brakes. You're gonna stop in 30 meters, okay? It's your stopping time. What we wanna know is if this car now goes 80 meters per second, how far are we gonna go when we hit the brakes at that deer? Okay, if you've had driver's ed, you know the answer to this and you don't have to watch me do the rest of it, but if you wanna know the physics behind it, watch and keep watching, okay? So we know, do the kinematics. VF squared is equal to VO, or V initial, squared plus two times our acceleration times our distance, okay? VF is zero. Right, because you're stopping. Hopefully it's zero, otherwise you didn't stop. So when we finish this, this will be zero, and we'll solve this in terms of its being equal to zero. Acceleration, when we're braking, is dependent on our constant of kinetic friction, okay? 
our mu k, and our normal force, which is gonna be g for the car. Okay, so we write this, zero is equal to v initial squared plus two times mu k g times d. Okay, <coughs> this is actually negative because it's the opposite. Okay, so v initial squared is equal to two times our positive now, mu k g d. Which means if we want to find distance as our final solution, we're gonna find that distance is gonna be equal to v initial squared over two mu kinetic g, okay? And if we wanted to say, instead of 40 meters per second and 80 meters per second, just call this v1 and two v1, right? Because 40 times two gives us 80. We can say that d1 of 30, d1 is equal to v1 squared over two mu k g. And d2 will be equal to, and notice it's not two v squared, it's two v squared, okay? Two v one, in parentheses, squared. That's gonna be a big deal in your calculators. It's gonna square just the velocity by itself, okay? Over two mu k g. Okay, these two are constants. They don't mean anything algebraically when we're trying to compare, okay? However, two V1 squared is gonna actually be equal to four V1, okay? At least it's gonna be four V1 squared, okay? It's gonna be equal to V1 squared multiplied by a factor of four, okay? So if we were to pull that out of the fraction, we understand that D1 is actually gonna be one fourth of the total distance D2. So if we stop in 30 meters after having to stop when we were going at top speed of 40 meters per second, we're gonna stop in 120 meters when we're driving 80 meters per second, okay? You're gonna hit the deer, probably, if you didn't stop fast enough. Which is why they say when you're driving on a road, you're doubling your speed and you're quadrupling your stopping distance. That's why it's really important now, when you're driving on the road, you understand these sort of things, and it's why school zones are a thing, it's why speed limits are a thing, because odds are the speed limit being 25 isn't due to the fact that your cops don't want you going fast, it's due to the fact that the turns you're gonna be taking and the intersections are gonna be too close for you to stop if you're going any faster and someone were to pull out accidentally. Okay, that's why school zones are 20 miles per hour. It's because kids run all over the place, you're not gonna be able to stop in time. Okay, and that's it. If you wanna see more, it doesn't exist because this is the first video on this channel. Have a nice night.